Now I will talk about what we'll cover today. We have a presentation by Kwaben Ansa and Beck Rohan Jones, who are from Load Agency and Icon Agency about free translations and aged care. So we just have very fresh information from their project and we really look forward to sharing it with you today. Then we have an interactive session with Lisa Tribuzi, the manager of the Center for Cultural Diversity and Aging. We have an opportunity to contribute and share um, your thoughts and we really want to get your feedback. Then we have a Q&A session with myself with uh, and Beck and Kwabena. And then Lisa will, um, in the final, final part of this of today, will talk about how to access this and where to go for support. The census just has come out and um, it's really important to highlight the diversity um, of the population in Australia to be aware of that. So the census told us that there's about 250 ancestries and 350 languages spoken in Australia. And that the numbers of people who are using English as another language has, in, has increased very significantly and has risen to over 5.5 million people. And the top language spoken at home at the moment, are, apart from English, are Mandarin, Arabic, Vietnamese, Cantonese, and um, Punjabi. And also the recent census has shown that there are around 37% people over 65 who were born overseas. Now, that doesn't mean that they're from culturally linguistically diverse backgrounds. That includes obviously people who were born in the UK, for example. According to the Department of Health data from 2020, around 28% of people using home care and 20% of people using permanent residential respite care were from a cold background. And as the Department of Health defines cold background as people who were born overseas in countries other than UK, Ireland, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and the USA. But in the recent paper from the Australian um, Association of Gerontology, um, it found that there's no one definition of cold. Um, there's also a very culturally diverse um, aged care workforce, as we all know. The number of direct care workers who identified as being from cult backgrounds in 20 was 21% of the total direct care workforce. And personal care workers account for 91% of all cult direct care workers. Our first presenter is Kwabena Ansa. Kwabena Ansa is responsible for load agencies, broader community engagement and research programs. We are very privileged to have him here today. He's a qualified IAP2 public participation specialist and he has worked with culturally and linguistically diverse communities across Australia since 2008. Kwabena has worked with the Department of Home Affairs, Melton City Council and with the New South Wales Police and Emergency Service Portfolio for New South Wales Minister. And our second um, presenter is Beck Rohan Jones. She has been a senior public servant for Australian government, the ACT and Victorian governments, where she worked with the Premier's Office and Minister for Employment as part of the pandemic response. In Europe, Beck worked as a media advisor and human rights expert for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet for the French government, so very international today, as well as teaching at the University of Strasbourg, European Commission, the British Council, and Harvard Kennedy School of Government in France and Spain. So I really want to welcome you, our presenters, to the to, for today, and I will I now hand over to you, Kwabena and Beck. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As Nikki's mentioned, uh, my name is Kwabena Ansa. And I'm the head of communities and strategy here at LOAT and part of a consortium delivering connecting older Australian project. Part of my role is helping to deliver key engagement opportunities for this project. Uh, joining me, as Nikki mentioned, is Beck Rowan Jones. Beck. Thanks, Kwabata. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to Nikki and Lisa um, and the team at the centre. It's just been absolutely fantastic collaborating with you to date and um, thank you for the opportunity to come here and present. I'm the Strategic Council for ICON Agency and I work between uh, the consortium partner members, LOAT, um, and a few of our other consortium members, which Krabana will speak to. And also, uh, we really deal daily with the department as well. So um, it's really, it's going to be, it's really great to see such a diverse audience here today. In today's webinar, um, both Beck and I, We'll take you through the project's background, the types of audiences and communication channels we have. we've identified, the stakeholders who help us to, um, in delivering this great project um, that the Department of Health and Aged Care um, have set up and how we intend to implement. And we want to talk about how we intend to implement the project. So to kick us off, I'd like to hand it over to Beck. Uh, to give us some background knowledge of the project. I'm conscious that I'm speaking to quite a diverse audience in terms of who's providing care and obviously there's some government 
representation. I can even see Monash has joined. So um, welcome to everybody. And uh, so I'll just try and keep it as a broad overview here. But it really, the back, background to this project really came out, as I think everyone would understand, is from the recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. Um, and from that stemmed the reforms that the government, the previous government and now this government, um, is driving forward. So this is a, one of many budget measures undertaken by the government um, and it's called Connecting Older Australians uh, to Aged Care Services. So better connecting with diverse audiences and diverse as Nikki pointed out so rightly is it's, it, it's almost endless um, that definition of what diversity is but for the purposes of the, this project and what we've defined it as uh, with the government is obviously the focus is on called audiences, um, First Nations, uh, speakers of Auslan and deaf, blind and blind. But we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into that late, um, further down the track. Um, but it aims to address that audience's needs. Uh, so it's a really broad ranging uh, project um, and it's specifically really for you as the providers, you are our primary target audience and it's very much about um, you having the resources to provide for your older diverse Australians. Um, so there's a range of, it's just, it goes into the background as ever, everyone in familiar with aged care, it's so our diverse Australians can make those informed choices and exercise choice in their own language. Um, so I really think that really underpins the program and, and the, the kind of the drive of this particular reform measure. As part of this project, and that's what uh, ICON has been brought in to do with the consortium partners, is to develop a really comprehensive communications and engagement strategy um, to drive enhanced awareness of this particular service, um, uptake and usage of not just this new free service, but also TIS National and other TIS services across across the ecosystem of what is on offer for interpreting and translating in Australia. We'll be doing this in an ongoing um, way through communications and engagement, obviously with the centre and many, many others. We're at the beginning of the journey. We've just set up the service. Um, so there's going to be a lot more engagement and communications as we go forward. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, this is this is the actual website, which is a brand new, shiny new website. Um, and we'll give you all the details at the end of this presentation because the whole point is for you all to be able to access this service. Um, so it's specifically for, um, with the guidance of the government, aged care peaks, the pickaxe, and aged care providers, whether that be um, respite care, home care, Commonwealth Home Support Program. Um, and if I haven't mentioned your particular, obviously residential aged care, uh, there's a list that is provided on the website. So the government has deliberately kept it super broad. So people can actually, you as organisations and individual and the workforce can use this service. And as I said before, it's very much so we can, um, as a community, as, as the aged care community and as a country, that we can actually ensure that care recipients are receiving information in their preferred language. Um, it's the services being offered and promoted by the website and you can see it there, diversityagecare.health.gov.au and you can get all the information at the end of the session. And that's a really good um, segue into this slide and I guess why you guys are here, um, the, the reason for the website is so that um, you guys can provide your organisations uh, can actually make a submission. So the trends we're seeing in terms of uh, translation request forms from aged care providers are diverse and, and range from pamphlets and booklets, um, process manuals, intake forms, welcome packages, posters, FAQs, and even cue cards. And uh, something else that I want to explain is that we can also do audio recordings and subtitling and voiceovers, video creations, animations. Um, and I guess what what I want to um, note to, you, um, to all the organisations here is that we, we know that some providers work with care recipients in over 100 different languages. So uh, we're able to translate most material provided we can find a NASI accredited, accredited translator. So it's important to know that some material may fall out of scope, such as ever-changing content from websites, news, newsletters, marketing materials, 
To kick off the process, what you need to do is go to the website, diversityagecare.health.gov.au, and submit a form. Uh, wait 48 hours, uh, 48 business hours, sorry, to hear a response from our amazing team. And then we'll begin the process. And from there, we'll share uh, approximate delivery times. The key thing here is remember that we'll get in touch with you and we'll talk with you about the request. So to develop the website and the translation service, that I think it's been really important um, in consultation with the Department of Health and Aged Care, um, who are our, that's who we're primarily working with, with this particular reform measure and this particular um, service delivery, is that we did look across a range of insights that we um, gathered. And interestingly, some of you may already know this, some of you are already working in research, obviously you're really close to this. And I think a lot of you on the call who are service providers, you are the insights, you are the actual origin of these insights. And we've gathered that through um, uh, data, face-to-face uh, -face interviews across the country. Um, so throughout, there was a drop of, uh, I'll just go through a few of the key learnings that has shaped um, the, the, the actual delivery of the service. There was a drop off in translating and interpreting services at the peak um, at the peak of COVID-19 uh, COVID in 2021. So people, older Australians were just not accessing the services. And I probably don't need to tell you why on, on the call, I think that it was, your sector was absolutely inundated in, in crisis management. And so there was a very significant drop off actually, and that was noted in, um, in a particular research piece. A lot of the feedback that we've done through specific research and then um, desktop reviews and analysis have shown that older people in general, and this is a pre-COVID um, insight that's been ongoing is that many older people find it hard to access the right information in their languages to actually understand what they need to have translated or interpreted for them. So this is a pre-existing barrier prior to, to COVID. And actually what has come back loud and clear, um, and the Department of Health and Aged Care have really heard it, we've all heard it, um, it's going to be a complex one to navigate and actually implement, is that there is a massively high demand for face-to-face -face options in terms of translating and interpreting. So they're just some of the key insights that we've come across. Um, and the other one that I really want to call out is that um, I think that for the aged care sector, and we have tried to convey this in our communications and approach and also with the department, is that you're facing COVID still. Um, and it's like there's a two-tier system really operating in our society where a lot of people and the general public are getting on with life and they're like, we don't want to hear about COVID anymore. But actually, your industry is actually still running pretty hard and fast and coping with COVID. So that insight kind of sits under all communications and engagement. For this specific translation service, aged care providers are definitely the primary target audience. It's really a service for aged care providers to um, provide what your clients need, what old Australians need coming into your service or already existing in your service. Um, so that's all Australian gov government subsidised aged care providers. Um, that's also including um, any um, providers who are under NATSIFAC, which is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders scheme. Um, and this is not an exclusive list. Uh, it's actually, there's many others. Um, and then our key audience, obviously, is health and aged care, um, social services, Services Australia, um, and the Equality Commission and primary health networks as well, who are very much going to be helping us uh, talk about this service. It's obviously uh, no, I don't even feel like I need to discuss this with this audience, but it is called Senior 65 Plus, but Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Elders 50 Plus. And of course, that includes deaf, blind, blind, deaf, or those who use Auslan. So they're very specific um, cohorts, but they are all covered under this particular translation service. And then, of course, if you are an aged care peak, obviously PICAC, uh, FECA, OPAN, and any other key advocacy or peak um, aged care body, um, you can also use the service as well. And just adding on in terms of the stakeholders, uh, as mentioned, the this consortium is made up of uh, First Nation experts and deafblind and, uh, in Willingali and deafblind and Auslan um, experts in ABLE Australia and LOAT um, being the multicultural experts. So 
in developing this stakeholder list, we all came together to identify the key stakeholders who uh, will need to inform, collaborate, and to help spread the word of the project um, and, and getting the word out there. By reaching out to these stakeholders, we've, um, as Beck has mentioned, we've obtained some insightful information. Um, and I guess so everyone understands on the call here, uh, we've set up uh, two project working groups. So one project uh, group was with Pickaxe Alliance and um, FECA, and the other was a cultural advisory group. So many of you already know uh, what the Pickaxe Alliance already does on behalf of providers, but the Federation of Ethnic uh, Community Council of Australia is the peak body representing Australians um, from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And it also manages the Encompass um, programs, which is a multicultural aged care connector program. And it's because of stakeholders like the Pickaxe Alliance and FECA um, that's helping us um, deliver this project going forward. In relation to, I guess, reaching out to providers, we've been going to uh, doing webinars like this, uh, as well as going to uh, conferences like the AXA conference. And uh, for the consortium, it's about attending conferences and webinars and um, getting the message out there that we want people to go to diversityagecare.health.gov, the website, and put in a request uh, to help um, the, the aged care recipients that you providers are uh, working with. We really want the word to spread across the country uh, so that um, we can help those um, providers uh, really uh, connect with their uh, recipients. I just wanted to touch on real quickly uh, about the feedback that we have received with the PCAC and the CAG groups and um, just some insights around that, uh, which is helping to inform, I guess, how we approach this project. So uh, what you see here from the CAG and PCAC um, we, the CAG itself is made up of uh, people from the deaf and blind um, and Auslan community, multicultural community and First Nation community. Uh, and they've also provided insights into the development of the communication strategy for this project. The types of feedback that we've received is that there's lack of Auslan material, um, material suggested for, um, for providers being videos, easy to read messages, icons or pictorial images. And that's a really uh, you know, pictorial images. Some people uh, don't necessarily uh, understand their cultural language. And so images uh, do help um, with actually getting the message across. Um, they've also identified that aged care workers needed to be uh, more trained with working with cold age communities. And that's some feedback that we've heard as well. So I guess um, over the long term, um, that's something that um, we're very aware of and departments are well aware of too. So, and uh, mentioned in spreading the word out, we definitely, um, the CAG and PCAC have identified uh, using channels like TV and radio. And from Lowe's perspective, we, we definitely uh, uh, saw during the pandemic, there was a real uptake in um, sourcing information from, uh, from the coal community on radio and on TV as well. Obviously, you know, the objective is it's really across the communications and engagement strategies that promote and encourage and ensure that the service is, is actually used by our aged care providers and peaks and and, and sector groups. Um, and as Kwabana, um pointed out, there's been a significant um, consultation over the last six months with PICACS and FECA and First Nations Group and um, through ABLE Australia, which is our obviously our, our deaf, blind and Auslan partner. So we've really focused on um, the best way to engage, just given that uh, I think the sector has an absolute massive saturation of information coming at them about reforms. Um, there were some 80 reform measures uh, or 120 recommendations from the Royal Commission. And within those recommendations, obviously, is just an enormous amount of information, compliance and all sorts of things, and it's going to keep coming. So I think the point for us is loud and clear is actually get the information to who needs it and to be as clear and succinct and human as possible um, so people can actually engage with it and understand 
that how this service can help you provide culturally appropriate care to those people who you are providing care for, because that is actually the point of um, the project. So the stakeholder engagement has brought us to this point where actually we really want to um, find the right channels and um, modes of communication that best suit you and best suit the sector. This has been done in consultation with our First Nations um, consultant, who obviously have some 30 plus years experience consulting across Australia and working on country. Um, it's really promote awareness across the three groups. We'd love to be able to use public service announcements, but in the event that that kind of thing doesn't roll out, we're really going to be relying on our out outreach through the pickaxe, through all through all the our key stakeholders. Um, particularly, I think with First Nations and the deaf blind community, um, community engagement and actually that outreach is super important. We're hearing that all the time, and e you know you wrap around our older people, our, our providers on the core are, and possibly informal carers, uh, formal carers, and then researchers and all other communities. We're really relying on you um, through to be able to get the message, you know, to support older people and what their specific needs are. So here obviously um, is a really good representation um, of the factors influencing how communication reaches an older person, obviously through radio, and then this there's poverty factors, providers, health, and a whole set of circumstances. We'll be using traditional channels. Um, we'll be using religious gathering places, community gathering places, social media, um, Auslan connections, and community TV and radio where we can. Um, and obviously our audience, which I've spoken to before. What can you do to help? So I guess what we're trying to say as the final takeaway is that a lot of work is being done behind the scenes um, at the Department of Health and Aged Care and within our consortium to improve access to aged care information for every older Australian and developing the tools to enable aged care providers to help achieve that goal. For you as aged care providers, um, we want to partner with you. Uh, we certainly want um, you and your team to uh, go to our service, which is diversityagecare.health.gov.au uh, to put in a form, uh, put in a request, and um, we'll get in touch with you. It was really fantastic, and I think it was a great insight into um, what you're already doing, and 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 a great opportunity for you know providers to get engaged with you. Thank you so much, Nikki, for that, and also Beck and Kwabana for your oversight into this really big national project um, responding to the needs of culturally diverse older people. We go to the first question, why not including LGBTIQI plus diversities in the whole design of the program? I was really happy to see that question and um, LGBTIQ plus audiences um, come under a range of other reform measures and there is a very specific area within the department. I know it's a really kind of government -y answer, but it um, that very important and particular cohort is looked after and it is something that we've talked to the department about because obviously they have more complex needs and especially if they're within cultural groups and on top of that they have LGBTIQ needs. So yes, it has been considered. And there was another question when people have the consumer ad feedback forms, they get information back in different languages and then they want to translate it back into English um, how does that work? Can people also get support for that from your project? We certainly want to um, help people and providers in that sense. So I think it's, uh, especially with the translation, um, uh, the offering uh, that we're putting forward, put in a request form um, and we'll look at that and assess it and make a decision. And like we said, we'll get in contact with the necessary provider to have that conversation about the outcome. So, yeah, put in a form um, and we'll be able to have that uh, look at what needs to be done and then we'll have that conversation. There was also an earlier question around literacy that was raised. So what are, um, and you mentioned as well in your presentation, that people can also ask for, I think, audiovisual formats for um, different yeah. types of videos, whatever it is. So do you want to just maybe elaborate a little bit more on that? 
what you can do as part of your project doesn't always have to be like written information. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And we know culturally, linguistically diverse communities. Some of them don't have um, written language and it, sometimes it's audio in which um, how they communicate. And so it's uh, a lot of the time some people can speak their dialect but can't actually read um uh, you know uh, their their language. I know me myself. I'm I'm Ghanaian and um, I I can understand tree, but if you wrote it in front of me, I would not. I would have no clue in how to actually uh, read it. So yeah, the project does offer um, the abilities for uh, audio translations. Uh, animations is a great is a great tool as well, um, and that whole pictorial. Uh, imagery and stepping people through a process through pictures sometimes and that really does work um, for especially um, older older cold uh, Australians um, yeah within within the service so I would advise uh, put in a form uh, let us have that conversation with you and then we can really um, you know get something moving for uh, your provider. There was a comment from Michelle um, she's mentioning that um, she feels that the LGBTQI plus community is, is a bit, bit left out with resources, part of the reform process. So we're just wondering if there's a, if you could maybe feed back, back to the department back in Kwabana to see that you know, language needs to be inclusive for, for everyone, for all diverse groups, and making sure that we hit the mark um, in terms of, you know, that it's... Um, uh, uh, it's, um, diverse in, in, in all these aspects. Is there anything that any light of hope you can give us or how you can maybe um, bring that, you know, back to the department? Having worked in the department myself prior to, to you know, really um, I think this particular project has been quite rewarding because the team that works around diversity um, obviously have links to other areas in the department and we really encourage information sharing. And we had some very specific feedback the other day um, around dialects and we passed that on to the department and we got an immediate response. So the, I think, I suppose, I can't speak on behalf of them, but what I can say is that they're really actively listening, which is kind of, you know, it makes me feel good personally, but I, I hope that provides some reassurance and I can't really speak specifically to all the reform measures that um, but I do acknowledge what you're saying about the Royal Commission and LGBTIQ, but I think the department really has um, that particular cohort's best interests at heart and it's doing its best to address them. We have the last question. How will the service um, manage multiple requests for the same item? For example, if asked for public brochures to be translated, for example, senior rights in a particular language, will the translated brochure be sent to seniors' rights so they can make it available to all? Or will the translation only sit between the provider requesting it and this service? So how is the process working there in terms of, you know, different organisations being involved in, in the translation project? Every request is treated as a single um, uh, transaction for a particular provider. So uh, if uh, senior rights um, make a request for a specific uh, pamphlet to be uh, translated or brochure, uh, we will make uh, we will do that for that provider. And if you guys, um, if they want to distribute it, um, you know, more than happy for them to distribute it across uh, their various channels. So, yeah, it, it's a single form. It's very much for one particular provider and it, it's very user-friendly and our team on the other end are extremely accommodating and will be in touch, as I mentioned, within 48 business um, uh, hours to have that conversation. There's evaluation points built into the to the service delivery as well, and that has been a consideration because there might be, um, as the work comes in, um, as the work comes in, I think that there may be circumstances like that. So that will be part of the evaluation process as well. That's really good to know. Thank you very much, Kwabena Beck, for the great um, you know insights for the Q and A. Everybody also participated. We really appreciate you know being so responsive. And I think if anybody wants to get more information about the project, please contact um, either info at culturediversity.com.au or go directly to the departmental website if it's specifically about the project. If you want to get more information, I encourage you to um, get in touch with Icon Agency through the Department of Health website. Let's give them all a round of applause, even if we can't hear it, just sort of applaud for the great 
<laughs> for the great presentation and the work they're doing. We've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to um, just give you a broad level overview of how to access um, interpreting services. So just to remind all of you that if you're an Australian government funded aged care provider, you have access to free interpreters. To do that, the provider's name is TIS National, and they work with the Department of Health um, and aged care to provide funded interpreting services to anyone funded under these categories. This presentation will be made available on our website, but if you need a copy, just email info at culturaldiversity.com.au and we'll be able to give you a copy of the presentation. In order to access an interpreter, you need to get the, um, the language that you need, um, the non-English speaker's name or the client's name and their contact details and get the client code from your organisation and dial 131450. Um, you will be connected to an interpreter on the spot. If you would like a scheduled um, video remote interpreting or on-site face-to-face or a pre-booked telephone interpreting service, they, these are the procedures here. So you need to get the language, the client code again, the client's name and phone number and, and instructions for the interpreter where they need to go, parking requirements, COVID-19 vaccination requirements and any other information they might need because all that information is going to go to the interpreter. Then you log on to the TIS online national website um, and you put in the client code and all the information and then they'll give you a booking number. You keep that booking number and the interpreter will arrive as required. And if there's any issues, you obviously ring up TIS and tell them the booking number. In terms of the Centre for Cultural Diversity, you know, ageing and where to go for further support. This is our webinar series for the next financial year. So we're really excited about our webinar series. These topics have been chosen in response to the sector's needs around supporting culturally and linguistically diverse older people. And the next one in August is co collecting diversity data to promote inclusive services. So if you don't know the languages of your clients, this is a really good webinar to go to because it's be able to start thinking about how to actually get the data to then um, inform your program responses. And we have um, our diversity coaching workshops, um, developing a diversity plan and supporting older people with a hearing impairment, food for thought, the link between food, culture and identity and our Harmony Week video launch, recognising multi-faith initiatives in aged care, recognising culturally diverse perspectives in mental health care and our cultural, cultural awareness walk and talk with our dear friend, Uncle Shane Charles, who's an Aboriginal community leader. Um, we're gonna do some healing sites and did you do healing? So you're all welcome to come. Just to let you know, um, all information is available on our website. And um, if you have a look on our homepage now, you'll be able to see a new button that we've created, which is have your say to improve Australian aged care system for cold seniors. So we really encourage you to fill out that survey. It takes seven to 10 minutes to fill out approximately. And it's to get your voices for an improved aged care system for cold seniors. So we really, really hope that you can contribute to that survey and sign up to our newsletter in the purple section on the homepage um, to get regular updates on what we're doing. You all now have access to our inclusive service standards um, portal as well. So, um, which is about sort of additional resources to create inclusive organisations. So if you go to our website, you'll be able to register for free for our portal. And that gives you a self-assessment as to where your organisation is at around inclusive services. Um, and you can also reach out to us for some support. We encourage you to have a look at our practice guides. We have a range of topics that might be relevant to culturally appropriate care. And on there, we have data and demographics, which we're going to be talking about in our next webinar, how to collect diversity data, working with bilingual staff, accessing interpreting services, and of course, our poster. You can print it out and promote our services across your organisation. And just to remind everyone that we are part of the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care Program. So there's a diversity advisor in each state and territory. Through the peacackalliance.org website, you'll be able to access a diversity advisor in your state and territory. So the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing is the Victorian provider, but we do provide services nationwide. We're doing this together in improving an aged care system for cold seniors. Um, we all care. Um, we're all here for human rights. So thank you very much. Please reach out to the centre if you have any questions and follow us on LinkedIn or our Facebook page or, or YouTube channel. Um, and also thanks very much again to Nikki for your uh, facilitation and for Sarah from Red Hat Films for the behind the scenes IT and polls um, and setting up everything. So thank you very much and we'll see you at the next seminar. Thank you. Mm -hmm.